and welcome everyone to our breakout session on Palestine, Israel and bridging across power differences. I am thrilled to be here with you all and I'm so excited to have our amazing speakers here with us who I'll be introducing to you all shortly. First, a uh, little bit of housekeeping. Uh, given the short amount of time that we have, again, only an hour together, we won't be taking questions from, from you all in the audience, unfortunately. However, please feel free to share your comments and questions in the chat, and I'll do my best to collect and save those because ultimately it's, they're important for us to reflect on um, the speakers and also the Othering and Belonging Institute staff. And it, your questions and comments are what inform our work and what we do. So your thoughts and what you want to share with us is very valuable to us. To introduce myself, my name is Basima Sizemore, and I'm a researcher at the Other and Belonging Institute in the Global Justice Program, and I will be the moderator for this discussion. I'm going to self-describe myself, and I'll invite the, our speakers to do the same when I pose to them the icebreaker question I have for them. I am a light-skinned brown woman with shoulder length, very curly, dark hair, dark brown hair, and I'm wearing glasses and a black sweater. And I have some really fun large turquoise and gold beaded earrings on in the shape of an upside down hand uh, or the um, otherwise known as the hand of Fatima or Al Hamza, which is used for protection and to ward off the evil eye. So I'm bringing some, some good vibes and some positive energy into our space and also a little bit of protection uh, for us in our virtual space today. And I'm going to help set the stage a little bit before I move into introducing the speakers and to the to, uh, into our conversation. So we, the organizers at the conference, wanted to bring Palestine Israel into the theme and conversation on bridging as a case study to examine and talk through how Palestine Israel human rights organizing allows us to consider real world challenges when it comes to bridging. We wanted to center and uplift the messiness and comfortability and risks that are present or can exist in reaching out across lines of difference to bridge, especially to do the work of what we're calling long bridging and what this conversation, long bridging in many ways is what this conversation will be centering on, but, but not only. And John Powell in his conversation yesterday with Judith Butler talked about three zones of bridging, the comfort and safety zone, the stretch zone, and the stress or panic zone. Long bridging is what we're identifying as the stretch zone. And it can look and feel different for each of us as individuals, as it's related to our own individual stress, stretch zone and where we personally feel that stretch for ourselves. It can also be explored spatially where it feels like there might be huge differences or a huge space between groups politically, ideologically, or in relation to their beliefs and even their values. It can also be thought of in terms of the degree of risk involved in bridging. And all this is to say that what I'm sharing with you in, in terms of contextualizing long bridging isn't meant to be a hard definition as it really is based on our own individual um, feelings around that stretch zone. And it's also important to note that all forms of bridging and especially long bridging require courage and involve us taking risks. Risk is especially present when we see how group-based identities incentivize breaking and disincentivize bridging and people risk being isolated from their community or group for bridging with groups that are at odds with each other. And expanding on the idea of risk, especially in the context of the United States and beyond, for example, people who support the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement or BDS movement, or who criticize Israel or challenge Zionism in support of Palestinian rights, run the risk of losing things such as their jobs, their livelihoods, as well as being targets of slander and other strategies that are intended to threaten silence and isolate people. And so all this is to show that there are many levels and layers of risk and breaking that can exist and that are incentivized to prevent us from bridging. So using Palestine Israel organizing as a case study, we'll be exploring a range of topics and experiences related to bridging, such as the different and important bridges that even exist, as well as to complicate those bridges. We'll explore what's at risk or what's at stake, when do we bridge and when do we not bridge? And ultimately, what does it mean or what does it look like to bridge with a power analysis? Meaning groups or individuals are coming together to bridge across lines of power with the aim to dismantle structural marginalization and oppression, rather than to continue to normalize the, exi the existing power imbalances and the harms associated with it. 
So I hope that provides a little bit of context and stage setting for um, the very enriching conversation that we're going to have with our speakers. I would like to share a little bit about each speaker and um, their full bios are on our website. So I'm just gonna give some sh uh, short and sweet sound bites for our uh, amazing speakers that we have here today. First, I will introduce Hawaii Arraf, who is a Palestinian American attorney and human rights activist. She has been involved in a number of legal and grassroots, grassroots initiatives for Palestinian rights, such as co-founding the International Solidarity Movement, or ISM, and she is also the former chair of the Free Gaza Movement and was a 2020 Democratic National Convention delegate. Stand up or do a hair flip or dance as I introduce you all, that'd be great just so people know who you are. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Saad Achan, who is the acting associate professor of anthropology at Emory University. He is also an associate professor of peace and conflict studies at Swarthmore College. His research is focused on contemporary Palestinian society and politics, global LGBTQ social movements, and Quaker studies and Christian minorities in the Middle East. Next, I'll introduce Christian Davis Bailey, who is a writer and cross pollinator based in Chicago. His work has focused on intersections between the Black and Palestinian struggles and Black internationalism. He is a co founder of Black for Palestine and he's a member of Left Roots and works at Palestine Legal. And I would like to introduce Sarah Ann Minkin who works at the intersection of human and civil rights advocacy, philanthropy, and education, with a special focus on Israel-Palestine. She is the Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. So again, welcome everyone. Welcome our speakers. So excited to be here with you all and to have this conversation. And I'm going to open up uh, our questions with a, a quick icebreaker uh, that I'll pose to all of our speakers. And that is to share a short story of how bridging has enriched your life. And I would also like to invite you all, if possible, to do a to self-describe yourselves for accessibility purposes. So to start us off, Sarah Ann, would you like to share your story? Sure. Thank you so, so, so much. I just I want to start with a thank you to OBI and to you, Basima, and to everyone who is here in this conversation. And to the other panelists, it's really an honor to be in this conversation with you. Um, my name is Sarah Ann. It's a double name. I, was, I am named for my mother's two grandmothers, and I have always been called by both names. I use she, her pronouns. I'm white. I have wavy brown hair down to my shoulders. I'm wearing a black sweater and gold hoop earrings and big glasses. And I'm going to try to be very brief with my story, which is to say that um, I am a a beneficiary of many years of Jews who have been in co-resistance with Palestinians. And a story that I will come, come back to maybe later in this session is just to tell the story of a time I spent a couple of years ago with Palestinians who had been expelled from their lands. A synagogue, this is in the West Bank, it's a village called Susia. A synagogue was discovered on that site. The Palestinians were expelled. The site became a Jewish heritage site. There's a lot more to say here, but to be brief, I will say that I had the incredible honor of being a part of a shared action of co-resistance where I got to help the villagers of Susia spend time in their original village, introduce their children to where they were from, return there for the first time in decades. And that is, an honor that only deep bridging can offer. Thank you, Sarah. Christian, what's your story? I've got, I'm going to start, but um, I'm Christian. Um, I have beautiful black brown skin, uh, kind of funky fade high top, natural hair look going on. Um, wearing a dangly red and gold earring, and in my background is a red, black, and green Pan-African flag and a portrait of Malcolm X. Um, and let's see, with stories, um, I think I'll just share, and I, you'll hear more about this a little bit later, but the scene is a Palestinian refugee camp in the north of Lebanon. Um, the room is filled with Palestinians who have been exiled from their homes for 70 years as well as a group of Black and Indigenous organizers from Turtle Island 
in Southern Africa. Um, and after arriving like five hours late to this meeting and being very stressed about it, um, we break bread. We hear a little bit about the context of what's happening in the, the refugee camp, but um, there's just kind of a pervasive sense of uh, just mutual understanding and even kinship um, across all these different people coming from different places who have only known each other for an hour. Um, but that's just one of the small moments of, of bridging across uh, struggles and, and, and uh, geographies that um, just enriches my life. Thank you, Christian. I like how we're getting short teasers for bigger stories that will come <laughs> later on in the conversation. Said, what would you like to share? Thank you, Basima, for moderating and such an honor to be part of this conversation. And thanks to everyone who's listening. Uh, I use uh, he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I have olive skin. I have a shaved head. Um, and I'm wearing a blue shirt and I'm in my office and my window with a beautiful tree is behind me. So for my bridging story, I'd like to share actually being introduced to a poem called The Bridge Poem uh, by Donna Kate Ruchin. It's one of my favorite poems in the world. So I'm going to use my limited time just to read it very quickly. <laughs> So she writes, I've had enough, I'm sick of seeing and touching both sides of things, sick of being the damn bridge for everybody. Nobody can talk to anybody without me, right? I explain my mother to my father, my father to my little sister, my little sister to my brother, my brother to the white feminist, the white feminist to the black church folks, the black church folks to the ex-hippies, the ex-hippies to the black separatists, the black separatists to the artists, the artists to my friends' parents. Then I've got to explain myself to everybody. I do more translating than the goddamn UN. Forget it, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of filling in your gaps, sick of being your insurance against the isolation of your self-imposed limitations, sick of being the crazy at your holiday dinners, sick of being the odd one at your Sunday brunches, sick of being the sole black friend to 34 individual white people. Find another connection to the rest of the world. Find something else to make you legitimate. Find some other way to be political and hip. I will not be the bridge to your womanhood, your manhood, your humanness. I'm sick of reminding you not to close off too tight for too long. I'm sick of mediating with your worst self on behalf of your better selves. I'm sick of having to remind you to breathe before you suffocate your own fool self. Forget it, stretch or drown, evolve or die. The bridge I must be is the bridge to my own power. I must translate my own fears, mediate my own weaknesses. I must be the bridge to nowhere but my true self and then I will be useful. Thank you, Saad. Huayda, what's your story? Thank you, Wasima. Uh, let me also reiterate what an honor it is to be part of this conference and thank you to everyone that is attending. I am a um, uh, olive skinned, I wanted to say young, but middle-aged uh, female with dark hair. It's um, it's straight, it's usually curly, but it's straight now and swept up in the back and I'm wearing glasses and a, a gray open sweater. And some of you heard me complaining when I came on and didn't know that I was live, that I uh, am in a very messy office that I share with my two elementary age school children. Uh, so my story, let me take it to a very, one that comes home. I, so I'm Palestinian American. I fell in love with a, uh, some, a man from a Jewish background. And that was not easy to, to break to my parents, uh, especially my dad. My parents came to this country, came to the United States when my mother was eight months pregnant with me. And the, they wanted to be able to start a family in a country, in a land where they believed that they could raise their kids in, in freedom and give them opportunity. And in Palestine, they couldn't, whether where my mom was from, the occupied West Bank, or from uh, 48, which is we call Israel now, where my father's village was occupied and Palestinians are treated as second class citizens, they uh, escaped that. So when my now husband, Adam, came to meet my parents and he flew from Tel Aviv to Detroit for one night and then flew back just to uh, meet them, my father spent the whole time uh, just grilling Adam on what his connections are to Israel. Did you serve in the military? Did your uh, relatives serve in the military? And all kinds of questions he asked it like a million different ways. 
Uh, in the end, Adam says, with all due respect, sir, the only Israelis in this room are you and your daughter because we have Israeli citizenship. And I say that it comes to mind that, uh, you know, when I'm asked this question is because these kinds of different identities, I'm a Palestinian American, uh, but I do have Israeli citizenship and thinking about my dad who has Israeli citizenship, but left. And it's not that he has anything uh, against Jews or Jewish people, but he knows that according to Israel and Israeli laws, his homeland, his land is more Adams because he's Jewish than it is his own. And, and that was kind of a fear where in that room where he's supposed to be the elder and the father and this man is coming to ask for his daughter's hand, he, I felt that he felt the, the power dynamic there. I'm happy to report now that like they love each other and our families get along beautifully. Um, so that's my story of bridging how it hits me uh, at home every day. Thank you, Hoida. And thank you all for sharing the, you know, bringing in some of your experiences and the different threads that will get tied into um, what you share later on in the conversation. So let's move into our opening question, which is open to all of you um, uh, to respond to. And the following questions are slightly more tailored to uh, your experience and expertise um, and sort of what you're going to bring into today's conversation, but feel free to respond to any of the questions that I that I ask all of you. But the first question is open to um, to everyone. So Palestine Israel has long been referred as the center of the world's most intractable conflict. And one of the tasks ahead of us is to flip this narrative and part of shifting the narrative connects to the question of why build risky bridges in the first place especially when political, ideological, and even values feel so different and appear so far apart from each other. When do we bridge and why is it important? And then building on the thread of narrative, who benefits when we promote a narrative of endless, unbridgeable hate? Who loses? And ultimately, how do we change the narrative? Um, shall I call on someone to go first? Okay. Um, Christian. Back in school, waiting not to be called on. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> it's the last person I want to be. <laughs> yeah, so my work focuses on Black and Palestinian solidarity. Um, and the reason that I focus on this is both because I want freedom and liberation from Black and Palestinian people but also because I see each of these struggles as a long bridge, if you will, for societies that are rooted in centuries of systemic uh, violence and injustice to uh, move from that violence to building a world where um, our, everyone's humanity is honored um, and respected. And so part of that involves a power analysis of the, the situations in which we, we are, both the, the US and uh, Palestine. Um, and just, understanding materially that we all are living here and in Palestine under an economic system um, that is capitalism, which is rooted in valuing profits over people, um, that incentivizes war and destruction, and which emerges from a 500 year legacy of European colonialism um, against indigenous peoples across the Americas, Africa, Asia, and even within Europe. Um, and so our task is trying to extricate ourselves from uh, the mess and the violence of, of that history. Um, and unfortunately, one of the barriers in that is uh, that people see uh, calls for justice from these systems as sometimes attacks on their personhood. Um, and so um, in some of the long bridging work that we're doing, one of the biggest challenges is separating um, both the idea of the nation or critique of the nation from critique of the individual, of a community, or even a, a cultural or ethnic group, um, and getting people to understand that these systems or the countries that we live in are actually built on divide and conquer, um, whether it's the racial hierarchy here in the US um, that places Black and Indigenous people at the very bottom, immigrants from other groups in the middle and white people at the top, or the similar hierarchy in uh, Israel-Palestine, where Palestinians are at the bottom of the society African and Arab uh, Jewish people are uh, just above that um, with European people, European Jews off the very top of the, the society. 
um, that when we see each other as, as enemies or we see the freedom or liberation of one group as a fundamental threat to our own humanity, it actually just helps uphold um, systems of, of militarism, racism, um, and violence that benefits no one. Um, and so um, I, I, I'll just pause there and continue some of these themes in a later discussion. Thank you, Christian. Huayda, what are your thoughts? You know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is wanting to understand that it's not such an intractable conflict, but we place it in that way by trying to say that, you know, we are so different from each other and we can't get along. This is a, a religious conflict and Palestinians are constantly saying it's not a, a religious conflict. Uh, in fact, I've had some Palestinians in the worst of circumstances say to me, you know, the the Israeli government is dividing us this way and creating this animosity between people who eventually have to live together. And Palestinians uh, often refer to Jews as our cousins uh, because we know that we do share a, a lot in common. And it's this political divide of, of Zionism that is a, 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 a political um, a, a political creation basically that that says, you know, Jews have certain rights, uh, have more rights to the land than Palestinians do. And it, that divides because that is assigning rights based on your background and, and who you are. And in order to maintain that kind of uh, division and, and supremacy, if you will, this this narrative of, of conflict and hate and we can't get along and it's religion and extremism. And when we're talking about solutions today, especially in the United States uh, on the political level, you're always hearing a two-state solution is the only way. A two-state solution is the only way. Why is a two-state solution the only way when, especially when, you, you know, Israel is insisting on being recognized as a a Jewish state for the Jewish people. So I mentioned that my, my family, I have Israeli citizenship, but I will never be equal in that kind of, uh, in that paradigm, in that kind of solution. Uh, a better solution would be a human rights paradigm where we are, uh, where we are crafting solutions based on making sure that everybody's rights are respected and not assigned based on our uh, race, religion, ethnicity, background, uh, whatever. And all live together and it might sound like, oh, I'm, uh, you know, I have rose colored glasses on, but really it's not. If we manage to look past, and yes, there will be post-conflict, uh, you know, post-conflict work to be done, but it can be done. It's definitely a, a better path than continuing to say that people can never get along and then and maintaining the status quo where too many people are getting hurt and, and killed. Thank you, Hoida. Said, let me pass it to you. I really want to reiterate Huayda's point that the framing of this conflict as an intractable conflict is incredibly problematic and that, you know, that decolonizing our imaginations is the first step in, in achieving decolonization in Palestine, Israel. Because if we can't even imagine liberation, we can't even imagine decolonization, then that colonial project has prevailed. And so ultimately that's what we need to resist. And I think that the Jewish-Palestinian solidarity that Sarah Ann works towards every day, the Black-Palestinian reciprocal solidarity that Christian embodies in so much of Christian's work, I think is the antidote to that kind of cynicism and nihilism that, that cripples social movements and that we should fight against. And I do think that losing hope is a privilege that most people around the world don't have. Losing hope and just arguing that, you know, this is intractable is basically what the privileged are able to do. But people around the world to get up each and every day, they need to have hope, they need to have a horizon, they need to feel that it's possible to survive and to one day hopefully thrive. I think another thing I'll just say very quickly is that I'm also really inspired by the work of Michael Rothberg, who's a professor of Holocaust studies at UCLA, and he has this brilliant book called Multidirectional Memory, where he argues against what he calls competitive memory, which is so often so many oppressed communities feel that you know, we have to maintain sort of a hegemonic narrative in terms of our suffering, our trauma, our victimhood, and that if we recognize 
the suffering or the trauma or the victimhood of others, that that will take away from the recognition of our own subject position as victims. So it becomes competitive. And he argues instead we should have multi-directional memory where we recognize that actually by recognizing the suffering and narratives and victimhood and trauma of others, of other oppressed communities, it helps bolster and it helps create more public discourse for the recognition of all of humanity. And it, it, it empowers all of us to achieve liberation. So I, I really am inspired by this more universal approach to thinking about social justice. Thank you, Saad. Sarah Ann, what do you make of the question? I'm lucky to on last, I almost want to say I agree with what everyone else said and launch into other things, but I, I'll, I'll reiterate just to say that um, the narrative of endless hatred says that Jews and Palestinians are by definition enemies and that this conflict is intractable. If it's intractable, if this is a conflict, which is already a question since what we're talking about actually is not a, a conflict among equal parties, but the dispossession of one party by another, but if we call it an intractable conflict based on religion, and people often talk about how it's been thousands of years of, of conflict, then the answer should be that both sides should just try to understand each other better. If this is about religion, we should call for religious dialogue then, or just for dialogue. But this isn't a religious conflict. This is a situation of active dispossession. And so, if we call it an intractable conflict, then we're not responsible for interrupting or just being responsible for the ongoing daily harm of dispossession. And I think that we counter the idea that this is an impossible conflict by trying to focus on what's really happening, by making Palestinian life and Palestinian experiences more visible in a world in which they are being made invisible. So for me, this is a question of how can I be a part of helping Palestinians to share their own stories and to share their own longings to return to the lands from which they have been expelled or their ambitions, ambitions for liberation, what that looks like. That to me is the work of deep bridging. Thank you all. And I think this does a nice job of kind of setting up the, the things that were the impediments that we're working with, the larger structural issues of, of bridging that we're up against in so many ways, including narrative and Zionism and um, colonialism and structural forms of oppression that, that, we've, that you all touched on. I wanna move into a question to you, Saed, um, in kind of expanding, like bridging within the context of Israel, is not limited to, nor should it be understood as bridging solely between Palestinians and Jews and Israelis. How can we expand the picture, the narrative and framing of the kind of bridging that is taking place? What might be missing from this picture and why is it important to uplift? Well, you know, I grew up in Palestine and now live in the Palestinian diaspora like Huwaida. And one of the things I encounter very often here in the U.S. is this discourse that somehow these Israelis and Palestinians are these people in a faraway land who for, you know, hundreds of years have been fighting each other. There's a kind of cynicism. But so many Americans talk about the conflict, the apartheid, the situation back home as if they're removed or detached. And I think that one of the big challenges in framing and reframing this and thinking about the range of actors that are involved in this conflict is that the US is a party to the conflict and that Americans are not just neutral observers, but the US is a party to the conflict and the US enables and sustains and fuels the oppression of Palestinians each and every day. And that for people like myself and Hawaii, the Palestinian Americans, hardworking, paying taxes in this country, we have to deal with the guilt, the, the moral calculus each and every day that our taxpayers are going to fund the oppression and of our families, of our communities, of our ancestral homeland, of our nation back home. And that's deeply, deeply painful. But the alternative is that, you know, we get sent to prison for tax evasion, and I don't think that will do any good ultimately in the long run. So, so this is the kind of compromise that we have to make each and every day by being citizens in this country, but also caring deeply about the situation back home. But, 
you know, but even Americans who don't have direct connections to Palestine, Israel are involved directly and in, in the prison industrial complex, in the military industrial complex, in supporting US foreign policy in the Middle East that's incredibly imperialist, that it's incredibly violent and oppressive and that that needs to change. And a huge set of actors that, that fuel all of this are Christian Zionists. You know, they often are invisible in this equation, but these fundamentalist evangelical Christians, thousands and thousands, millions of them across the United States who have this apocalyptic view of the world, many of whom are anti-Semitic themselves, who are allied with right-wing Israeli politics and continue to support the oppression of Palestinians. And ironically, in the name, I think, of profound misinterpretation of the Bible are supporting the oppression of all Palestinians, including Palestinian Christians. So also as Palestinian Christians, our voices are you know, silenced. We are largely invisible in the hegemonic public discourse. Our realities are, uh, our stories are not shared. Our narratives are not known and how we live under Israeli colonialism and military occupation as well. And the kinds of suffocation of Palestinian life in general, including Palestinian Christian life for both Christians and Muslims. So a lot of bridging work is being done and more needs to be done here in the US in engaging people on their own complicity with the apartheid system in Palestine, Israel, but specifically also in engaging American Christians to open their hearts and open their minds to fight anti-Semitism, to fight Islamophobia, and to also resist the oppression of Christians in Palestine as well. I want to ask a quick follow-up question. Whose role do you think that is in terms of doing that bridging with these specific Christian communities in the United States? Well, I really want to give a shout out to, for example, Sabil, which is the Palestinian Christian Liberation Theology Center. It's a very long name, but in the U.S. there's Friends of Sabil North America, and they do incredible work in this respect. Also, there's an organization called Telos, T-E-L-O-S, and they're doing amazing work. They've taken thousands and thousands of evangelicals from the US on delegations to Palestine so that they can engage with communities on the ground. But this is the tip of the iceberg. I think we need a lot more work to do. There's a lot more work. And also the onus and responsibility can't be shouldered solely by Palestinian Americans all the time. There's so few of us, we're all stretched so thin, we're exhausted. Um, and so we need more allies, I think, to help uplift our voices and to expand the conversation holistically. Thank you, Saad. I want to move to Christian, uh, sort of continuing on this trajectory of um, the different kinds of bridging that is happening and the different kind of bridging work that is taking place in relation to Palestine Israel organizing. What is some of the territory or bridges you have to navigate as a Black organizer for Palestine? What are the opportunities and challenges that exist for Black and Palestinian communities to build together to advance our shared global struggle? Uh, thanks, Basima. <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, I'll just say that my work focuses more on bridging between communities under struggle than it is bridging, long bridging with uh, communities more complicit, directly complicit in our respective uh, oppression or situations, but uh, I'll try to share some pictures to illustrate what's going on. Um, but yes, yeah, so the focus of my work with Black for Palestine has been largely in bringing together um, Black and Palestinian uh, organizers in service of joint struggle. Um, and so... Uh, really want you to see these pictures, so let's see. Um, but what that has looked like has been um, bringing together, yeah, as I said, groups of um, Black and Palestinian organizers in places like Washington, DC, New York, the Bay Area, um, but mostly in Detroit, where I lived for four years. Um, and so for those who don't know, Detroit is the largest Black city in this occupied nation. Um, and it immediately borders the city Dearborn with the highest concentration of Arab Americans or Arabs in the also in this occupied nation. Um, and so there's lots of opportunities there for bridging uh, kind of across struggles and movements. Um, and so uh, we, yeah, we, we, we did bring together people from the two communities, but we also 
faced uh, a few different challenges um, that generally come up in solidarity work. Um, and so one of those was just kind of uh, maybe lack of understanding of the urgency of the Black struggle outside of issues of police brutality um, or police violence, um, but understanding that we too are one of the oldest victims actually of colonial, Western colonialism, um, who were indigenous people in Africa stolen to this continent and have lived for decades or centuries rather without our own self-determination. Um, and so as a result of, of, of that lack of understanding of our struggle, um, it's much easier for um, immigrants to the US to see the black struggle in Detroit or to dismiss it even. Um, so to see issues of water shutoffs or people being evicted from uh, foreclosures as, oh, they just, they're not operating the community in the right way, or if they followed the rules, things would be okay. Um, not understanding it structurally, that is very similar to uh, Palestinians in Jerusalem being evicted from their homes uh, because they didn't follow the rules that Israel imposed on them, or uh, the targeting of access to water in Gaza. Um, and so um, one of our, our struggles is kind of getting people to see that um, uh, the struggle for Palestine is an urgent and important one against colonialism, but for members of the diaspora who are living here, uh, you're also on occupied territory where there are also urgent struggles against colonialism that are worthy of, of support, uh, specifically the Black and Indigenous struggles. Um, on our end as Black organizers, one challenge was around just seeing our own struggle as being domestic and inward and not necessarily looking across borders or outside of the Black or African diasporas. Um, and this is where kind of some of the legacies of the 60s and 70s were uh, much stronger, where there are much stronger links between different struggles across continents and even across ethnic groups. Um, and so part of this is what led to um, some delegation work bringing Black and Indigenous organizers from Turtle Island and from Zambia and South Africa to visit our family in the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, um, where in some cases they live just an hour, two hour drive from their original homes, but have been exiled for 70 years simply because they're not Jewish. Um, and so in some of this solidarity work, I'll just give an example of um, our icebreaker for some of these conversations. Um, so we split people up, uh, Black folks and Palestinians, or just Palestinians and non-Palestinians, and we're asked to answer uh, the following two questions. Your full name and where you were born, and the full name of your mother's mother and where she was born. Um, and this exercise actually comes from the late Dr. Vincent Harding, who um, was a, an intellectual um, advisor to, to Martin Luther King, and help draft his speech against the Vietnam War. But the idea of this uh, uh, question is to both root ourselves in the land in which we come from, to see kind of what has torn us away from that, uh, where our grandmothers were born, and also to root us in the struggles of, of the women in our family who uh, just often bear a lot of the brunt of uh, uh, just carrying families through very violent histories and, and legacies. Um, and so from this simple conversation, people began to have very immediate understandings of, oh, okay, so you also were displaced from your land in Alabama or in North Carolina. And um, like you face these structural issues that we face in education or access to employment or people viewing your communities as too dangerous to enter. Um, and so there was this very just beautiful kind of immediate acknowledgement of each other as kindred family, even if we didn't fully understand our own kind of issues. Um, and there's a lot more to say, but I think um, I will just pause there and, and say that um, we need more infrastructure for more solid cross-movement kind of interactions that are less on an individual level and more on the level of, of social movements. And I can say that um, the Palestinian struggle and Palestinians are indebted to the work, the groundwork and the struggle of Black um, communities and Indigenous communities in the United States. And there's definitely a lot of work to be to be done, as you mentioned. I'd like to move to Sarah Ann and ask how you understand your role in building or navigating risky bridges on the topic of Palestine Israel within the Jewish community. And from your experience, what are the risks, opportunities and challenges involved with that? And as well to ask, how do you navigate bridging with Palestinians while organizing and naming that Jews have institutional power? How do you bridge conscientious, conscientiously, transparently, and with a power analysis? 
So a big question, and I'm so excited to hear everything you have to say. I love that you just said a big question, as if that's one question. <laughs> that's a dissertation, and I love it. Thank you for that. Um, so I, I want to, to back up a moment, and I'm going to um, take, take Christian's uh, inv invitation at an introduction also, since I said I named for my mother's two grandmothers to say that my mother's two grandmothers came to this country, came to New York and raised their families there. And they came to New York from Eastern Europe. And um, my grandparents were raised speaking Yiddish and in Jewish communities. And, and I too, not raised speaking Yiddish, but I grew up in a Jewish community, a tight Jewish community where in, in Atlanta, where, um, what I spent my time on and most of the people I knew and spent time with were Jewish. I went to Orthodox Jewish school during the week and synagogue on the weekends and dedication to Israel, commitment to the state of Israel as a value in and of itself is something that we were raised into, something that was very deep in our psyches and so much a part of the world that we take it for granted that Israel is what we belong to and that people who are against Israel are against us. That's what I come from. Um, my particular family as I was growing up was progressive except for Palestine. And I feel very lucky for the progressive part because that actually became an entree for me um, towards that I had, I'm very lucky I've had multiple opportunities and a lot of support to undergo very fundamental changes in my life. And I unlearned the Zionism that I was raised on and I relearned how to connect both to the land and the people of Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel, and also to my own Jewishness and Jewish community. And this is not the moment to talk about the details of that transition, except for to say that I feel very lucky about it. But, uh, and that um, because that is where I come from, and because this is so much of what I love, my work is very much at the intersection of bridging both with Jews and with Palestinians. So I'll, I'll start just by saying that to bridge with Jews we need to understand, I think, where most Jews are, which is to understand that Palestinians are not a part of Jewish conversations on Israel-Palestine. It is very unusual in mainstream Jewish discussions for Palestinians to be seen as agents of their own freedom. If they're talked about at all, they are talked about as threats to Jews. Most of the time, Jews engage with, the, with Israel or the ideas of Israel as a, a tool for our own Jewish identities or Jewish experience of the world and Palestinians, their history, their current experiences, their ambitions are secondary to that. I started a project with a colleague to experiment with Jews of what, it, what does it look like to center Palestinian voices in our engagement with Israel-Palestine. And it's a learning project where we study Palestinian texts. That means articles, books, visual art, poetry. And to do that, this I think is the work of but what it looks like to start bridging. To do this work, I ask the, the um, Jewish participants to be witnesses. And what does that mean to be witnesses? It means to witness the Palestinian perspectives that they are encountering through the texts and to witness themselves as they're engaging with these texts, to witness themselves, to pay attention to what feels hard, what resonates, what texts do they think they could share with their own communities and what would be hard in sharing them? It's, there are concepts and ideas that immediately shut down conversation in mainstream Jewish spaces. And the goal, one of the goals of my project, of this, this idea of, of witnessing and of centering Palestinian texts is to try to find a little more space, to try to take the, the tightest knots the places where we think that the ideas are just completely unbridgeable and to try to loosen those knots by observing what, what happens to me, what happens in me, like Sa'id's poem that he started with, where we return to ourselves, we return to what is true for us, what is authentically true as a way of trying to bridge to our communities. So I, I wanna say that about Jews and also just to note that you asked me, what is at risk for Jews? who do this kind of, of bridging or thinking about Palestinians or adv that's, that's even to say before you, you enter into the world of advocacy or solidarity, what is the risk for Jews? The risk is that you'll be othered from a community in which you think you belong 
And for many Jews, this, ex this kind of othering can feel like an existential death. Being Jewish is so, so central to so many of us. Um, and being Jewish is the thing, the, I am sitting in Atlanta today, actually, at this moment, I'm sitting in this country because my ancestors were Jewish and were in danger because they fled. So if my danger and my safety are bound up with being Jewish, then being cast out of being Jewish leaves me feeling, or cast out of Jewish community, leaves me feeling exposed in a, in a way that is, can be existentially terrifying. So that is a part of the risk for Jews. And a part of the opportunity is to recognize that through this work of bridging to ourselves and to and with Palestinians, we get to reshape, to rebuild, to reclaim Jewishness, Jewish values, Jewish resilience, Jewish stubbornness, whatever, whatever those values and ideas are that my ancestors carried with them and dedicated, committed to me, I get to rededicate now and reclaim them. And then the next question, if you'll give me another moment, is about bridging with Palestinians. And so, like I said, Palestinians are not a part of Jewish conversations on Israel-Palestine. And I think that to bridge with Palestinians, we have to start with the idea that there's so much we don't know, that there's so much that we have been socialized into not even knowing that we don't know it, to thinking that we know this place, Israel, without even understanding that we don't know this place, Palestine. So a bridge, brings things together that weren't already connected. This is, this is bridging. And I think that we start doing it with listening to Palestinians, with trying to make a process, make a practice out of radical empathy. With, once we're starting down that road with amplifying Palestinian voices, which is what I am trying to do with my learning project. And it is what I do. I work at a foundation that is not Jewish and not Palestinian, it, it is American. And we are uh, working for justice and rights and dignity for Palestinians and, and, and Israelis. And part of our focus is on Palestinian efforts in particular. What does it mean to support Palestinians in particular in their advocacy work, in their efforts to stay on their land, in giving them access to audiences that they otherwise wouldn't have access to if we didn't say, here we are with our institutional power, with our funding, with the media that is so interested in what Americans have to say or in what Jews have to say and to offer Palestinians to work closely with Palestinian partners to give them access to those stages. And then the, I'll say two last things. One, I think in terms of bridging with Palestinians is about trying to take responsibility for, for what is mine trying to take responsibility, which is also about seizing opportunity. So in the, in the opening, I mentioned this one village to uh, this one visit to this village, Susia. And I should say that when I'm in Israel, Palestine, I try to go into the South Hebron Hills, which is an area that is under particular threat of dispossession, of settler violence, of settler expansion onto Palestinian land, um, state-backed settler violence, I should say, of, and of IDF violence. And this particular village was expelled, has, and and welcomed Jewish solidarity, welcomed Jews working with them. And I had this beautiful experience of um, accompanying Palestinians from Susia back to their village, their village that is now an archeological site for Jews, ostensibly telling the story of, of my history and doing that with, funded by the state of Israel and funded by North American Jewish donors who have signs and placards at this site. This woman from Silver Spring, Maryland donated this thing signs at the entrance to what were Palestinian homes describing Jewish life 1500 years ago, signs that are um, so offensive, so morally offensive, and so upsetting. Why am I telling this particular story? Because of the incredible honor it was to be able to accompany Palestinians back to their lands, back to their home, to help them tell their stories to their children, and to give them this audience of these North Americans who wanted to listen, and to be able to say, these people from Silver Spring, Maryland, who donated that money to put this plaque right here, are actually an, 
in my mind, insulting our ancestors and insulting any part of Jewish tradition that actually has moral and ethical value. And so deep bridging to me is being rooted in what my values are, what my vision is, rooted in that, and then showing up with and for Palestinians and listening, not imposing, but listening and making space to listen some more. And then as I'm listening, bringing more people along and trying to provide the scaffolding and the help that people need to be able to get out of their own ways, to have a little more looseness in ourselves and in all of the defenses that we have built up against listening and to help us actually try to get into the practice of radical empathy. Thank you much, Sarah, so much, Sarah. I know um, it's not fair, some of the questions I'm bringing in as they're, each, one could, each of you could speak an hour just on the one questions that I'm, that I'm putting to you all. So thank you so much for unpacking so much in there around risks, around in shifting institutional power, um, the, the deep bridging work and, and how you see that and how you see your role in that. Thank you so much. I wanna pass it to Huayda and to ask in thinking about some of the power dynamics at play that Palestinians have to navigate when bridging, can you help us navigate, um, or sorry, uh, yeah, can you help us navigate when bridging across difference might normalize or paper over structural marginalization and how making sure bridging is instead a crucial step in dismantling structural marginalization? And then um, I'm gonna be cruel and also ask, this connects to the question, of at what cost do we bridge? Where do we draw the line as Palestinians when it comes to bridging, if we draw the line? And ultimately, is it our responsibility as Palestinians to initiate and engage in dialogue or reach across uh, to try to convince or change people's minds about our right to liberation and self-determination? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can address all that in the time we have left, but I'll try. Sarah Ann, uh, thank you for all your work. It was I found it really interesting, especially the part about working with Jews to read Palestinian writings and trying to understand that and, and being witness. I will uh, maybe give the opposite in, in trying to answer this question. I used to work for like 20 years ago, an organization that supposedly was to bring Palestinian and Jewish uh, teenagers together uh, to learn to like each other, break down stereotypes, break down walls. They go to a camp together, then they come back and, you know, uh, in Palestine, do projects together. Anyway, build these kinds of connections in the hope of in the future you have better leaders. There were a lot of problems with that. First, you know, the the, the peace loving world or those that just talk about, you know, solving the, the conflict uh, in terms of both sides, you know, talking both sides instead of talking about Palestinian liberation and freedom and, uh, and decolonizing, you talk about both sides. So the, the, uh, the people on the outside, the United States, the, you know, citizens of Europe, et cetera, people that you need to mobilize in order to put pressure on, on their governments to change the policies that enable Israel, that support Israel, and enable Israel to continue doing what it's doing. They're looking at these uh, projects as such a good thing. Look at their getting along. And it, it's, it's very problematic because you use it for the most part as a feel good. Um, you know, something to make you feel good and that you've done something, whether you're participating in it or whether you're supporting it, and you're not looking at what to do to actually um, start breaking down or decolonizing or breaking down these structures that oppress the, uh, the Palestinian people. And so we call it normalizing right now, obviously, uh, where some of you may be aware, very Palestinian, um, Palestinian liberation movement very much against any all of these projects. So I used to work for it and I, I saw firsthand not only how it's effects negatively affects our struggle in this way, but also the kids themselves. You know, we brought them together and they're supposed to be bridging, if you will, and understanding each other. And they became the best of friends across these lines, Jewish, Arab, Palestinian, Israeli, which is great. But there wasn't, there was this approach that we have, a, we can agree to disagree. 
when you're talking about your stance on something and your political views on something, okay, when you're talking about a history of what happened in this, and that's what sometimes we brought them together for difficult conversations to um, focus on history, and they'd be very contentious and, and uh, you know, feelings, emotions very high, and then you agree to disagree and, and people separate with, you know, it's still a, a flaw, not understanding uh, not having a, a shared understanding of history of what really happened. And you can have different understandings of what, what you went through or what you understand to be, but there is a fact of what happened. And trying to gloss over that by saying that, uh, you know, we can agree to disagree or you'll have your version, I'll have my version. That does a great disservice to the people that you know, were, th that continue to be um, uh, oppressed, but that were also throughout the decades um, uh, slaughtered, dispossessed, uh, and made refugees in their own land and out of their own land, and, and that are suffering a great injustice. That you you gloss over any kind of of justice for these victims or survivors if you're talking about you know eventually post conflict. If you can't even understand and recognize what happened, and then. I told you these kids became best of friends, but still the structures, you know, we would have to take them home. We would take the Israelis home to their cities or, or towns, whatever, a, a 30 minute drive or, or an hour, two hour drive. When we had to take the Palestinians home, you had to go through checkpoint after checkpoint and around sometimes mountains or, and watch the Palestinian child have to go through a checkpoint while an Israeli soldier is aiming a gun at them. An Israeli soldier that very much could have been the uncle or the brother or the sister of their new, you know, Israeli best friend. And there, and the kids didn't, the projects like this didn't do anything to address, again, the root cause of what's causing these separations. When you bring people together, they discovered they had a lot in common um, and really best friends when I'd say, this was in two, when I was there, 2000. Then the Palestinian, the Intifada, and an uprising broke, broke out. And you should see the Israelis did not understand why is my best friend protesting? Because your feel good project, again, did nothing to dismantle the structures that were oppressing. So uh, I, I know we're short on time. When, when we're talking about Palestinians and, and what we do in our liberation movement, a lot of people like to say, you know, or like to hear kind of both sides, or some Palestinians might even uh, uh, buy into this. If I have an Israeli with me, that it, it, what I'm saying becomes more valuable, etc. Uh, and and we have to overcome that ourselves. Yes, we can talk to uh, Israelis and Jews, and dialogue is always welcome. But but in what kind of again, in, in what structure, in what context? And then we ask ourselves: Is it our on top of and said mentioned on top of everything else that we have to do as part of our liberation we have to go and convince jewish israelis or zionists those that support the, the zionist project that we are deserving of human rights and freedom that is that is separate from from dialogue that is uh you know a, a whole s a structure or understanding that's created where we have to um ask for ask for our basic rights from those and again convince our oppressors that we're deserving of these rights and I there may be different views on this I don't think that that's necessarily uh, that that is at all actually uh, our obligation I think it's it's better done through project like Sarah Ann's I think that and in Palestine a lot of Jewish Israelis come to that are opposed to Israel's actions come to work with Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territory that's great, of course, but the real work needs to be done inside Israeli society because a large, the overwhelming majority of Israeli society, unfortunately, continues to harbor very racist views towards Palestinians, and they keep electing very racist and right-wing governments that uh, you per perpetuate the um, the suffering of the, uh, the Palestinian people. And poll after poll is showing that the the racism and the way that they look at Palestinians is getting even stronger. And so there's got to be a lot of society with Zionists, but it's not the obligation of Palestinians to be doing that. I think it's like projects like Sarah Ann's and the, the, the Israelis that come to work with Palestinians, great, but 
also how do you do that work back home? Um, so I, there's a lot more to be said on this, but that's kind of it in general and, and where we move forward. I think that uh, I, I've also done a lot of work with international and, and Palestinians and bringing internationals to see what's happening and people from all over the world. And there is also another power dynamic there because we know that internationals can almost go wherever they want with their foreign passports, places that Palestinians can't go in their own homeland. And so how do you work together knowing that um, sometimes using that privilege of, or, or buying into the racism that says, um, as an American citizen, I can walk on this road and I'm going to do that to be able to get to uh, this place to be able to help this person. But the Palestinians can't walk on this road. So do we use that privilege to get to the end to, to help or do we reject that privilege? And I think in, in uh, overall, when we're doing this kind of work and we want to bridge through these power imbalances, recognizing them is obviously the first step and having the discussion with the people most impacted and with the oppressed about what they need. As, as was said before, centering Palestinian voices and centering voices of, of the oppressed, recognizing that we're coming in, whoever's coming in with more um, privilege and what do you do with that privilege? And that's gotta be a discussion with the, 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 the oppressed, the marginalized um, in order to work for again, a, a collective, if you will, liberation. Thank you so much, Huayda, and what a powerful point to end on and thinking about the work moving forward and, and how to do that. We have, we're gonna transition back to the main stage, but I just wanna say that this is an invitation to continue having these conversations and that OBI is looking for, I personally and OBI is, per, is looking forward to continuing um, and having these conversations with you all and bringing this conversation um, in, into our work. So again, thank you so much for, for sharing your insight, your experience, your expertise, and just being here today and um, looking forward to work, uh, building and working with you all in the near future. So thank you again, and um, let's join the main stage. Bye everybody, thank you for joining.